Sakoi Gar. Greetings, I am Tad Larkin, the lore master of Mandalore, and today I'll be digging through the archives to elaborate on the tactical genius Grand Admiral Thrawn. There's a degree of risk involved, but risk has always been an inescapable part of warfare. In this case, the potential benefits far outweigh the potential dangers. Mithrach Nuruido, more famously known by his core name, Thrawn, was a male Chiss born sometime before the Clone Wars on Kisilla, homeworld of the Chiss and capital of the oligarchical Chiss ascendancy in the unknown regions of the galaxy. Who Thrawn's birth parents were is lost to history. However, we do know that he and his brother, Mithrach Savis, or Thras, were born as commoners, but were brought into the Eighth Ruling Family as Merit Adoptives, after Thrawn graduated officer training and entered the Chiss Expansionary Defense Force. It was common for the Ascendancy's ruling families, of which there were nine during this time, but that number did fluctuate, to adopt promising young military officers who showed great talent in the academy into the family, and if you left the military, you were at risk of being disowned. Thrawn, however, didn't seem to be at risk of disownment, and as his career unfolded, he quickly rose through the ranks, becoming the CEDF's youngest commander, and impressing the 8th ruling family to the point where they had him up for consideration to become a trialborn, i.e. a permanent member of the family. While Thrawn greatly impressed the ruling families, within the military, however, was a different story. Yes, he was extremely talented and had a penchant for strategy, tactics, and logistics, but he would often find himself in disagreements with many of his superiors. Fundamental to the Chiss Ascendancy's military doctrine was a strategy of defense. They would strictly refrain from entering conflicts unless otherwise provoked, and the Ascendancy's idea of colonization and expansion were to find and settle uninhabited planets, planetoids, and asteroids, avoiding worlds with already indigenous sapient populations. Thrawn, on the other hand, was a fervent believer in the preemptive strike, neutralizing the enemy's ability to strike at you before they can even mobilize, and as the years went on, he grew increasingly wary of the nomadic hyper-aggressive Vagari Empire, and the scouts of the mysterious beings the Chiss called the Far Outsiders, who are later identified as none other than the Yuzhan Vong. Apart from his professional life, Thrawn was a great enjoyer of art. From paintings to sculptures to architecture, Thrawn had the uncanny ability to not only identify the artist just by looking at a piece, but could also identify the species and culture of an artist of an unidentified piece. Again, all just by meticulously observing the artwork. 27 years before the Battle of Yevon, Thrawn was in command of the cruiser Springhawk, and serving as the task force commander of Picket Force 2, which was on a surveying mission in the Khrushchei system, when two ships of designs never before seen in that part of the galaxy exited from hyperspace and were exchanging fire with one another. The vessels, which were later identified as the Corellian Light Freighter Bargain Hunter and a hut ship under the command of Proga the Hut, were in blatant violation of Chiss sovereign space, so Thrawn disabled them, capturing the Bargain Hunter in the Chiss equivalent of a Connor net and destroying the hut vessel when it had returned fire. Three human crew members of the Bargain Hunter were brought on board the Springhawk, Captain Dubrak Kento, Maris Farasi, and one George Cardass, who, after observing that he was more curious than afraid, unlike his fellow crewmates, Thrawn took a liking to. Using the Outer Rim trade language of Psy Bisti, Thrawn was able to communicate with his guests, and gathered that they were smugglers from a previously unknown civilization called the Republic, and were on the run from Proga the Hut. And recognizing the opportunity to learn more about them and this civilization, Thrawn intended to hold them for longer than he was originally. Of course, he promised to reward them for their cooperation, to offset the costs incurred by missing their deadlines, and through multiple exchanges with Cardass and Farasi, Thrawn began teaching them Chiyun, 
the main Chiss language, and Minisiat, an easier Chiss trade language, in exchange for them teaching him the Galactic Basic Standard. Upon returning to Khrushchai base, Thrawn got reports of a Vagari ship that had unwittingly entered the Restricted Zone and had its hyperdrive disabled by a sentry. So, Thrawn moved in and disabled the ship's weapons and led a boarding party. And after clearing the ship of enemies, Thrawn found a cache of treasure, and more to his interest, art, from a multitude of different alien species and civilizations that the Vagari had raided or conquered. Bringing the captured ship back to Khrushchai, Thrawn discovered that he'd soon be entertaining guests, an aristocra from the fifth ruling family, Chaff Form Bintrano, as well as his brother, who tagged along as a surprise, and the two were not at all impressed by these humans brought before them. And in a follow-up visit from CEDF Admiral Ar Alani, she was flabbergasted that Thrawn not only taught these outsiders their language and culture, but also allowed them to roam the military installation unsupervised. Reports came into Thrawn that an inhabited system on the edge of the Ascendancy's borders was under attack by the Vagari, and Thrawn took his picket force to investigate, and once there, he made a rather bold move. Recognizing that the Vagari had brought with them an experimental gravity well generator to keep their foes from jumping to hyperspace and escaping their doom, Thrawn actually moved his ships into the battle at the opportune moment and stole the gravity well generator right out from under them, bringing that too back to Khrushchai base. Getting word that even more unidentified ships had entered Chiss space, Thrawn left Ar Alani to continue investigating the captured Vagari vessel, and took with him 12 ships, including 3 cruisers like the Springhawk and 9 support craft, along with multiple fighter wings, and most importantly, his new toy. To Cardass's surprise, upon exiting hyperspace, a Trade Federation fleet comprised of two Lucre Hulk battleships, six Techno Union hard cells, and seven escort frigates lay in wait and intending to further confuse the trespassers, Thrawn, in basic, broadcast to them his demands for them to identify themselves and their business in this part of space. The human liaison, identifying himself as Stratus, revealed to him what Cardass had already relayed to him about their origins, but refused to state their business, and before more dialogue could be exchanged, the Nymoidian Task Force commander, Vice Lord Cav, abruptly closed the hailing channel and commenced an attack. Overconfident, the Trade Federation forces overextended themselves, and Thrawn used their weakness, their automated vulture droid starfighters, to his advantage. And as the battle raged, mistake after mistake was made by the Trade Federation, which Thrawn was quick to exploit, until he pulled an astounding victory out of what should have been a defeat. Only the flagship of the Trade Federation task force remaining, and unable to escape thanks to Thrawn's new interdictor generator, they were now more open to talking with the Chiss commander. Not long after being threatened with droidicas, Thrawn sat down with Stratus, and he revealed to the Chiss commander that their original purpose had been to lay in wait for an ambush on a Jedi-led expedition called Outbound Flight and Stratus even went as far as to plead for Thrawn to destroy Outbound Flight for them. Thrawn wasn't too keen on this, so Stratus pulled out all the stops and further revealed his reasoning, coming out as Kinman Doriana, Supreme Chancellor Palpatine's advisor and agent for the Dark Lord of the Sith, Darth Sidious, he had him speak with his master via holocom. Greatly impressed by the alien commander's tactical abilities, Sidious revealed his concerns to Thrawn about outbound flight possibly provoking an earlier invasion by the far outsiders, that Sidious had become aware of when one of his acolytes, Verger, had been captured by them a few years earlier. Having heard reports of Admiral Ar Alani suffering Pyrrhic victories against the Far Outsiders in two previous skirmishes despite grossly outnumbering them, Thrawn was thoroughly persuaded, and he devised the plan in which he could use the Trade Federation to take out both Outbound Flight and the Vagari at the same time, eliminating the possibility of having to fight a two-front war against the Vagari and the Far Outsiders in the future. 
With plenty of resources at his disposal, Thrawn ordered the conversion of several vulture droid starfighters into glorified guided warheads, and relied on Cardass to instigate an attack by the Vagari, to which he then set up his forces with Gravity Well Generator in tow at the intersection of the predicted vectors of both the Vagari fleet and outbound flight. The moment finally came when the six Dreadnought Heavy Cruisers arrayed around a cylindrical core that made up outbound flight arrived just as expected, and not wanting to needlessly slaughter innocents, Thrawn hailed them several times before he was finally answered, and he tried to convince the expedition's leader, Jedi Master Joris Sabayoth, to turn around and return home, or he'd be forced to fire upon them. The sudden arrival of the Vagari put an end to talks, and both Thrawn's fleet and outbound flight soon found themselves slugging it out with the hyper-aggressive nomads, and as the battle raged, Thrawn released his secret weapons, the modified vulture droids to take out their critical systems, and he activated the B-1 battle droids given to the Vagari leader by Cardass, which promptly slaughtered the Vagari High Command. With the Vagari fleet in tatters and the Jedi distracted by the immense loss of life, Thrawn took the opportunity to surgically strike at outbound flight's shields and weapon systems, and offered them one last chance for them to return home. However, Sabayoth responded by choking Thrawn with the Force, and if it weren't for Doriana's quick thinking, redirecting the remaining makeshift droid bombers to attack the already damaged outbound flight, Thrawn may have died that day. In the battle's aftermath, Thrawn, Doriana, and the newly arrived Aristocra Form B argued about what was to be done with the remnants of outbound flight, giving time for Thras and about 60 remaining colonists on board outbound flight to jump to a secluded star cluster called the Redoubt to await negotiations to send the colonists back home. However, the severely damaged ship didn't make it, and ended up crash landing onto an uncharted planetoid. Though the battle was won, Thrawn was dissatisfied with the unnecessary loss of life, and that the remnants of the Vagari had escaped to fight another day, let alone the fact that his brother was now missing. However, he was able to negotiate keeping his commission and standing with the 8th family by offering the gravity well generator to the 5th family as a bargaining chip. Thrawn was now under the watchful eye of the ruling families, and wanting to please them and increase his standing, he turned down two separate offers from Darth Sidious to join his cause. But in hindsight, he should have taken him up on those offers, because Thrawn was eventually exiled to an uncharted planet following a tribunal against his actions. In 19 BPY, not long after the declaration of Palpatine's new order, an Imperial Victory Class Star Destroyer, the VSD Strikefast under Captain Voss Park, stumbled upon Thrawn's dwelling in exile, following the pursuit of famous smuggler Booster Tarek, who had jumped randomly into uncharted space to evade capture, much like the crew of the Bargain Hunter did years earlier. For two days, Thrawn evaded capture, using his surroundings, the local fauna, and the local flora around him to his advantage, devising traps for Imperial stormtroopers, and even managing to stow away on the VST strike fast, before he was finally captured and brought before Captain Park. Rather than imprison or execute the blue-skinned, red-eyed alien, Park was impressed that this one being had caused so much damage and headache, and recognized that the Empire could greatly benefit from having him in their ranks, and he could also possibly distract from his failure to locate Booster Tarek. Thrawn was brought back to Coruscant, now Imperial Center, and in a special audience with the Emperor, Palpatine was outwardly skeptical of this new alien brought before him but inwardly delighted to have the commander who destroyed outbound flight for him back in his fold, and approved of Thrawn's training and mentorship under Voss Park. Due to the Empire's extremely xenophobic policies, Thrawn had his training classes at the Imperial Academy on Carida conducted in private, as a special case was made for him in the human-dominated Imperial military. Upon graduating from Carida, his first commission was serving as a colonel on a Carrick class light cruiser, and on this tour of duty, Thrawn discovered an abandoned fortress on the planet Nirawan, on the edge of the unknown regions. 
Ever proving himself the capable leader over the years, Thrawn was promoted to captain around 3 BBY, and led his first campaign against the Kalish species when they initiated a second Huck War with the Yamirai, which led to Thrawn commencing Base Delta Zero, the codename for orbital bombardment, upon the Outer Rim world of Oban. One year before the Battle of Yevon, in recognition for his loyalty and command capabilities, Palpatine reassigned Thrawn to the ISD Vengeance, the personal Star Destroyer of Inquisitor Jarek, with hopes that he would keep tabs on the Miraluka Dark Jedi for him. It was under his command of the Vengeance that Sullus Moon, Sulan, was raided by Imperial forces masquerading as Rebel Alliance troops, which accomplished the twofold tasks of wiping out the Sulan rebel cell and stirring up anti-rebel propaganda, as well as the capture of Morgan Katarn, Kyle Katarn's father. In the aftermath of the Death Star's destruction at the Battle of Yavin, Thrawn was one of a handful of military minds called on by the Emperor to plan retaliatory actions against the Rebel Alliance, and it was his suggestion of disrupting their supply lines and interrogating every captured smuggler that would eventually lead them to the new Rebel base on Hoth in 3 ABY. Eight months after Yavin, Thrawn was promoted again, this time to Senior Captain and was placed in command of the ISD Admonitor at the head of Task Force Admonitor, charged with defeating an alien warlord named Nuso Espa from the Unknown Regions, whose fleets were challenging the Empire's power in the Kandoras Sector. Through reconnecting with an old friend, George Cardass, and requesting additional support from Darth Vader himself, Thrawn's task force managed to severely diminish Espa's forces through a protracted campaign. Task complete, Senior Captain Thrawn was transferred back to his previous command on board the Vengeance, and it was during shore leave on Sakur in the Expansion region where Thrawn had gone planetside to see some of the local artworks in the Circadian Gardens, and ended up putting down an incursion of carnivorous drog beetles. A year and six months after the Battle of Yavin, following his rooting out of a rebel cell on Naboo and destruction of a rogue manufacturing facility on Corellia with rebel sympathies, Thrawn was promoted to Vice Admiral. Not long after his official promotion, Thrawn was called before the Emperor for yet another promotion, this one in secret, with only him, the Emperor, and one of the Emperor's hands, Mara Jade, in witness. He was to become the 13th Grand Admiral, one of the highest positions within the Imperial Navy that previously only 12 were permitted to occupy at any given time. Needless to say, the other Grand Admirals were not happy about this, and looked at Thrawn with contempt, and despite his high station, he still fought an uphill battle against the rampant xenophobia within the Imperial Court, and was eventually exiled by his adversaries to surveying missions in the Unknown Regions. His exile was in truth sanctioned by the Emperor, who entrusted Thrawn with a tremendous task, create a satrapy, an Imperial buffer state, in the Unknown Regions, to be the first line of defense against the eventual invasion by the Far Outsiders. Once again at the command of the Admonitor, Thrawn returned to the abandoned fortress on Nirwan and set up establishing a foothold, and apart from receiving Imperial troops and materiel to help accomplish his task, many young Chiss from the nearby Ascendancy clamored to Thrawn and formed what he called his Household Phalanx. The forging of the Empire of the Hand was now underway. Thrawn allowing non-humans into the military of the Empire of the Hand was revolutionary, and he even collaborated with the Chiss to create the Nessus class Clawcraft, a hybrid of a Sinar Fleet Systems TIE Fighter and Chiss technology. Thrawn and his men spent the subsequent year and a half establishing military outposts, surveying uncharted space, engaging in diplomacy, and combating hostile alien civilizations, all in the Empire's name. At the tail end of the year 2 ABY, Thrawn was recalled back to Imperial Center, much to the ire of the other 12 Grand Admirals, but he would pay no mind to them, as he was contacted by Darth Vader to help him with a special task. 
Vader, at this point, was constantly butting heads with Prince Shizor, head of the Black Sun Crime Syndicate, and wanted him out of the way, but Shizor had an understanding with the Emperor that neither would interfere in each other's operations, making it impossible for Vader to deal with him directly. Thrawn was tasked to take out Zekka Thine, one of Shizor's most trusted Vigos, in an effort to distract the Falleen crime lord. The catch was that Imperial forces could not be directly involved, so Thrawn impersonated an impersonator, and donned the Mandalorian armor similar to Jodo Cast's, who was famous for claiming to be Boba Fett to hike up his rates. As it turned out, two Corellia Security Force agents, the future Rogue Squadron member and eventually Jedi Master, Koran Horn, along with his father, Hal Horn, were also pursuing Thine, and the trio joined forces and apprehended the Black Sun Vigo in Coronet City on Corellia, while Thrawn's forces took care of his henchmen. In reward for Thrawn's contribution, Vader took Thrawn to Honiger in the Outer Rim, a planet devastated by a biohazard accident during the Clone Wars, and there he introduced him to the Nogri, who had sworn undying loyalty to the Lord Darth Vader following his arrival and subsequent promise to help heal their world decades earlier. In front of his fearsome Nogri Death Commandos as well as the Dynasts of the Nogri clans, Vader proclaimed Thrawn his successor, and made the Nogri swear fealty before him, and Thrawn even chose one particular Nogri that stood out to him, Rook, as his bodyguard. In the months leading up to the Battle of Hoth, Thrawn worked behind the scenes to help root out the Rebel Alliance, orchestrating the fall of many shadow ports with Rebel sympathies, as well as dealing a devastating blow to the Alliance fleet at Dera IV, before departing to the Unknown Regions to tend to his affairs with the Empire of the Hand. Following the Battle of Hoth, Thrawn was recalled again, and among his accomplishments, he helped pacify the Bakunai system from pirates, defeated the crime lord Tiber Zahn of the Zahn Consortium over Carida, and saved the Emperor from a coup orchestrated by Grand Admiral Demetrius Zarin. In a battle above Imperial Center, Zarin was able to make his escape, and the Emperor charged Thrawn personally with hunting him down and defeating him. So, Thrawn, with his best forces, chased Zarin from the colony's region to the Midrim, before finally defeating Zarin at the edge of the Unknown Regions in 4 ABY. With the traitor Grand Admiral dead, the new TIE Defender kept out of Rebel hands, and the Emperor's faith in him secured, Palpatine redispatched Thrawn to the Unknown Regions to continue his work. Shortly after the Zarin campaign, both Palpatine and Vader were killed during the Battle of Endor in 4 ABY, and as the Empire descended into chaos with various moths, admirals, and governors carving out their own miniature empires as warlords, Thrawn continued his expedition of exploring, surveying, and expanding in the Unknown Regions. Contrary to popular belief, Thrawn wasn't completely in the dark of what was going on in the rest of the Empire, and maintained contact with Imperial Security Bureau Director Isani Isard, who had taken command of what remained of the true Empire following its division by the Warlords. He was assured by Isard that she had things under control and to continue his mandate, so he did just that, leading the Empire of the Hand to victory against the Saurian Cisruvi Imperium whose remnants were later defeated by the Rebellion and the Empire on Bakura. Following his defection from the Empire to the New Republic established in the Rebellion's wake in 5 ABY, Thrawn managed to secure the loyalty of famed TIE fighter ace Baron Suntir Fell, whose family would faithfully serve the Empire of the Hand until its dissolution and incorporation into the Imperial Remnant decades later. By 8 ABY, the New Republic had made substantial gains against the Empire as well as the Warlords, liberating Coruscant and defeating major Imperial Warlords like Sandra Del Vardis and Warlord Zinj, and this shrinking of the Empire was also severely diminishing Thrawn's resources in the Unknown Regions. This lack of logistical replenishment, combined with the lack of contact with the Imperial leadership, and possibly at the behest of the reborn Emperor Palpatine on Biss, as some later historians have theorized, contributed to Thrawn's return to the wider galaxy. 
While Thrawn's return was celebrated by some, it was not by all, especially Grand Moff Artis Kane of the Pentastar Alignment, who, although accepting Thrawn's leadership of the Empire, he refused to commit any of his military resources he had in his accumulated territory, especially his Super Star Destroyer, Reaper. No matter, Thrawn would make do with what little resources he had available to him, and he had taken command of the remnants of Vader's Death Squadron, leading it from its new flagship, the ISD Chimera, with Captain Gilad Pelion as his second in command. First order of business, the new Supreme Commander of the Empire re-established contact with Delta Source, a spy listening post built within the Imperial Palace, which would keep him a step ahead of the New Republic. Next, he needed to secure a painting, but this wasn't just any painting, this was Killick Twilight, and within it, it held secret comm codes used by the Rebellion before its reorganization. On that front though, Thrawn wasn't so lucky, as the newly wedded Han and Leia Organa Solo worked with Kitster Banai, childhood friend of Anakin Skywalker, on Tatooine to keep the painting out of Imperial hands. By 9 ABY, Thrawn had finally accumulated adequate resources to begin hit-and-run style attacks on New Republic outposts and border worlds, basically using their own tactics against them. And at the library world of Obroa Sky, Thrawn managed to destroy a task force of four New Republic assault frigates, with just the Chimera and a few picket ships. With information gleaned from the Obroa Sky raid, Thrawn could proceed with the next phase of his plan. Amongst the data, he found the location of one of the Emperor's secret storehouses on Wayland in the Outer Rim, but first he had to make a stop at Merker. On Merker, Pelion came to an agreement with the smuggler and information broker Talon Card, who had set up his base of operations on the Forest World, to allow him and his men to collect Isalamiri, a tree-dwelling reptile with the amazing ability to repel the Force, an evolutionary feature developed by them as a defense against their Vornskir predators who used the Force to hunt. Thrawn arrived on Wayland to a not-so-warm welcome, and there he met the guardian of the Mount Tantis facility, a half-insane clone of Jorah Sabaoth. And with Isalamiri protecting him from Sabaoth's bouts of Force lightning, Thrawn came to an agreement with the cloned Jedi Master to not only allow him to access the facility, but to join him and bolster his forces with Jedi Battle Meditation, and in return, Thrawn would deliver to him Luke Skywalker and the yet unborn twins of Leia Organa Solo. With the Mount Tentus facility secure, Thrawn now had cloaking devices, Spa'artai cloning cylinders, and a Dark Jedi at his command. And with these three elements, he had what he needed to crush the so-called New Republic, which he still referred to as the Rebellion, and restore the Empire to its former glory. Nogri Death Commando squads were assigned to capture Organa Solo and Skywalker, tracking them to Bimisari whilst on a diplomatic mission for the New Republic, then to Kashyyyk, where a very pregnant Leia Organa was sent to lay low, and her Wookiee hosts were able to thwart the Nogri and even capture one, Kabarak of the Clan Kimbar, who, upon realizing that Leia was the daughter of Vader, vowed to not harm her. Meanwhile, Thrawn began making use of the Spartai Cylinders to start cloning more stormtroopers and crew for his new ships, which were the next phase of his campaign. And he conducted a few more raids, including one on Bipfesh in the Sluis Sector. Thrawn's next move was on a mining operation on the hostile world of Niklon that just so happened to belong to Lando Calrissian. And despite Han Solo and Calrissian trying to defend the operation, Thrawn made off with several mole miner vehicles. With all of the pieces in play, Thrawn made his first serious attack against the New Republic, this time at the shipyards above Sluis Van where the New Republic was refitting a number of its capital ships to serve as cargo ships, and despite Thrawn's clever use of the mole miners to insert boarding parties onto the ships, he only made off with one before being forced to withdraw by Skywalker, Rogue Squadron, Solo, and Calrissian. The Sluis Van operation going bust, Thrawn initiated his plan B, and began searching for the long-lost Katana fleet, 
a flotilla of about 200 Dreadnought-class heavy cruisers that went missing before the Clone Wars, the location of which was allegedly known by only one man who discovered it by accident, none other than Talon Card, who Thrawn promptly captured. Back on Kashyyyk, Chewbacca took Leia aboard the Falcon to meet with Kabarak above Endor, and from there, Kabarak smuggled her to Honiger, and Leia, whom they venerably referred to as the Lady Vader, almost failed to convince the Nogri to defect to the New Republic when she discovered that the Empire had been deliberately faking its cleaning efforts to purposely keep the Nogri indebted to them for as long as possible, and the Nogri took this as a great offense. Thrawn was visiting Honiger at the same time Leia was there unbeknownst to him, but he left abruptly after getting word that the Millennium Falcon was in orbit above Endor, and it is there where he captured Mara Jade, who had been working with Card and ended up reluctantly working with Luke and the New Republic after a debacle on Merkur. Whilst in captivity, Thrawn had remembered Mara from the Imperial Court, and tried to persuade the former Emperor's hand to work for him but she was stubborn and fiercely loyal to Palpatine. However, her reverence for the former Emperor was shaken when Thrawn revealed to her that she was not the only Emperor's hand, which Palpatine had brainwashed her to believe. Mara escaped Thrawn to team up with Luke again to rescue Card, and though they were successful, Thrawn ended up learning the location of the Katana fleet anyways from an engagement with Garm Bel Iblis, one of the founders of the Rebellion who branched off shortly before the Battle of Yavin and was thought dead, and he had discovered the Katana fleet and took a few of the Dreadnoughts for himself. It was now a race to the Katana fleet, as the New Republic had learned its location from both Card and Bel Iblis, who came back into the fold with the help of Calrissian and Solo, and once there, the New Republic and the Empire engaged fleets. However, Thrawn emerged the victor, making off with 180 dreadnoughts. With his fleets bolstered, Thrawn unleashed an all-out assault on the New Republic, dispatching smaller fleets to Ando, Filve, Condra, and Ord Pardon. While at Yukio, Thrawn made use of his new cloaking tech he found under Mount Tantis, and slipped two cloaked dreadnoughts underneath the planet's shields before they raised them. Then, Thrawn used Sabaoth's battle meditation to perfectly time orbital strikes from both his Star Destroyers and his dreadnoughts, making it look as if he could shoot straight through Yukio's shield and the planet capitulated to the Grand Admiral. This same technique was repeated at Wustree, with the same result. And, following another failed attempt to capture Skywalker at Poderis, Thrawn moved his forces to attack Ord Mantell and then Mirist, before dropping Sabaoth off at Wayland at his behest, and finally moving on to Coruscant. Thrawn was no fool, however. He was perfectly aware that he didn't have the resources to effectively lay siege to the galactic capital, and instead took with him several cloaked asteroids, some of which he hurled at Coruscant's surface, and others he set loose in orbit around the planet before withdrawing. Though only 22 cloaked asteroids were in orbit, Thrawn had ordered several dry firings, leaving the New Republic believing that they had to find around 286 cloaked asteroids before they could lift their planetary shields. The Grand Admiral effectively had Coruscant besieged without having to hold a fleet in orbit. Admiral Akbar, who was away from Coruscant during the siege, gathered his forces and began looking for ways to speed up finding the cloaked asteroids, and unfortunately, the only way that could be found was through something called a Crystal Grav Field Trap, which Thrawn had in his possession at Bill Bringy, his most fortified shipyard. Akbar set his forces up to make it look like he was going to attack nearby Tangreen, and hopefully draw the Grand Admiral away from the CGFT. However, Thrawn recognized Akbar's feint for what it was, and chose to remain his fleet at Bill Bringy, forcing Akbar into a direct engagement at his heavily fortified position. The Mon Calamari Admiral had played right into Thrawn's trap, and using interdictors to keep them from escaping the battle, Thrawn may very well have achieved his ultimate victory that day had it not been for two oversights on his part. The first being Joris Sabaoth's death at the hands of Luke Skywalker and Mara Jade, who had raided the Mount Tantus facility, and the second being his own Nogri bodyguard, 
who had learned what the rest of his people learned from Leia Organa's visit to his world, that the Nogri were effectively being enslaved by the Empire, and bided his time for the opportune moment to strike back. As the Grand Admiral sat in his command chair, watching the battle with great anticipation, Rook plunged his blade through the back of his chair and into his chest before fleeing the Chimera's bridge, and Thrawn, drawing his last breath, stated, <laughs> But... it was so artistically done. As he had done during the Battle of Endor after the Emperor's death, Captain Pelion took command and ordered a general retreat. The New Republic had won the day, and the Empire's dreams of reconquest diminished with the return of rampant warlordism. Thrawn had contingencies, however. Bringing some of the Spa'artai cylinders back to the Empire of the Hand, he had himself cloned, and prepared simulations and other training for him to grow up to be as smart as his progenitor. That too, however, was sabotaged by Luke Skywalker and Mara Jade during a mission to Nirawan in 20 ABY. Some view Grand Admiral Thrawn as a cold, calculating villain, while others maintain that he was a misunderstood patriot, attempting to prepare the galaxy for the Yuzhan Vong incursion. But however you may view him, one thing remains clear his contributions to warfare, and his brilliant tactics have left a lasting legacy, and he is still studied in military academies in both the Imperial Remnant and the Galactic Alliance even to this day. This ends my findings on Grand Admiral Thrawn. If you have any suggestions for future transmissions, don't be afraid to drop a comment. Special thanks to my patrons, Wildcat144, The Grand Pope, Zexant, JTribs1997, David Miller, AJ Can't Think of a Good Pun Right Now, Dave the Grave, Zim the Despot, Matt Patton, Trav, SW Archivist, Posh, and Hawk2274. If you'd like to support this channel, and perhaps even commission your own video topic, please visit my Patreon to find out how. Link is in the description. In the meantime, keep your calm channels open for future transmissions, and don't forget to subscribe. Tad Larkin, out.